So 34 years ago, nearly to the day, by the side of Candy Lake in Sri Lanka, my mum gave birth to this adorably cute little boy <laughs> who would uh, grow up to have a little bit more facial hair. It was a relatively peaceful moment in a year that had been anything but. Three months earlier in Sri Lanka, race riots swept through the streets. And we, used to, we lived in Kandy, which was, we thought, relatively insulated and far away from the heart of the riots. But the riots found us. In the middle of the night, mobs ran through our street and burnt down our house. And my pregnant mother, my dad, and my brother and sister fled. My parents don't really talk a huge amount about what actually happened in those days. But what I do know is that within a few days, a friend of the family put us up in their house. We eventually made it to Australia. And when we got there, this spirit of people helping us out continued. People helped us find furniture for our house. People helped us find clothes. People helped us get a loan so that when my parents were students, we could actually afford a place to live. People helped me learn English. They even gave me free cake. <laughs> and so I grew up on this diet, not just of free cake, but of stories that said, when you are in need, people will answer. And when people ask you for help, it's your responsibility to put your hand up and do something. And so when I open the newspaper every day, for me, it's all fake news. These stories of people building walls, these stories of people shutting out people in their hour of need, those stories don't reflect the world that I grew up in. And this idea that we're a group of mean-spirited people that don't actually care, that doesn't reflect the people that I've come across in my life. Because I know, deep down, each and every one of you, given the choice, would give this kid who doesn't speak any English his free cake. And so I always was kind of filled with this idea that there are these hundreds of thousands of people out there that want to do something to make the world better. All I had to figure out was how do I help them get from having an idea to getting it done. And if you could get all those people to put their hand up, what actually would happen? So four years ago, I set out to actually answer this question. And the first thing that I discovered was there actually was a heap of people who had ideas that, to change the world. And they would have this idea they would tell their friends about it, they would get excited, and then they would get stuck because they couldn't build a community or raise funds to make their idea a reality. And so we decided that the first thing that we needed to do was make it incredibly simple for people to raise funds, to build a community around their projects and build, make their projects come to life. In 2013, uh, I started a crowdfunding platform called Chuff.org, dedicated to helping those people with social impact projects. In our first year, we raised a million dollars in donations through the platform. But more importantly than that, we supported 300 projects come to life. And I just want to tell you the story of one of those projects, and uh, bear with me uh, with this, because it's a hard one to tell. So 26 years ago, Abdi and Fatuma and their four little children found themselves in the heart of the Rwandan Civil War. They had to flee. 
And as they fled from the hail of gunfire, Abdi, the father, lost grip of his nine-year-old son, Syed. The family made it to Australia. Syed didn't. For 10 years, the family sat in Australia thinking that Syed had died. And then two Red Cross workers, Jane and Joan, they tracked down Syed to a refugee camp in the outskirts of Kenya. And for years, Jane and Joan petitioned the government to let Syed return to his family, but to no avail. In early 2014, Abdi, the dad, found out that he had a terminal illness. He only had a few months to live, and, and his dying wish was to see his son. So Jane and Joan kicked into action again. They got 35,000 signatures, and they petitioned the immigration minister directly, but to no avail. Abdi died without ever seeing his son. It was at this point that we met Jane and Joan. They launched a campaign with us because they were like, we just need to do something for this family. And they, ra they wanted to raise $15,000 to fly Fatuma over to see her son, who was no longer a nine-year-old boy. And in a day, they got their $15,000 and they had to shut down the campaign because too many people wanted to donate. It was a way that people who cared about this issue could finally do something that meant something to them. On the 23rd of January, 2013, I opened up my email and I got this photo. After 23 long years, Fatuma had been finally reunited with her son. Now, every day of my life for two years was filled with stories like this. And, but like nothing prepared me for what was to come in 2015. And we were sitting in far off Australia down under when news of the Syrian refugee crisis broke. And while my news feed was filled with these stories of governments closing borders, my chuffed feed was filled with these stories of Brits opening their hearts. It was, it was like nothing we'd really seen before. It was like a switch had been flicked in the collective consciousness and people said, this is my problem. If I don't do something, if I don't do it now, no one else is going to do it. And so they did. They got in their cars, they got on the train, they crossed the channel, they went to the camps in Calais and Dunkirk, and they provided programs of care. They built schools and family centres. They built libraries. They built kitchens. They raised money for phone credit. And we got this glimpse of what the world looks like when everyone puts up their hand and does something. Now, in crises like these, each of these individual stories is amazing and beautiful. But there's actually a much bigger story going on when you look at them as a collective. And it's a story about what happens when a group of loosely connected projects act in unison towards a common goal. This is what they achieved. The first thing that we noticed was that they acted with an incredible speed and flexibility. So while the large charities, which are normally the people who respond in this situation, were quick on their donation pages, they were slow in their planning and even slow on the acting. These campaigns, these smaller projects, were up in days, not months, and when the need changed, they changed with it. 
And the, probably the best example of this was a project actually in, uh, with, uh, with a different disaster when Cyclone Pam flattened Vanuatu. The very next day, the High Commission of Vanuatu put up a chuffed page to raise money for Port Villa Hospital because that was the most important thing that they needed to raise money for at that point in time. They needed to get the walls back and the roof on. And they got their $20,000 pretty quickly, and then they asked the ministers on the ground, what do you need next? And they were like, we need to fix up the chief's house because that's where all the decisions are going to be made on what happens here. And so they switched their projects over to that. People on the ground were directing exactly what needed to be funded in real time. The second thing that happened was that people were going into really remote areas that were hard to get to. Now, normally for most of these projects, they went to the big camps in Calais and Dunkirk, but a lot of them head further afield into camps in Greece and Turkey. Um, one of the most, what I thought was crazy at the time, was this 23-year-old Muslim lady who raised money to ship a tonne of flour, so I'm not quite sure how a tonne of flour looks, uh, but a tonne of flour into the heart of Syria. And to make sure that it got there, she went with it. Now, most of the, the, the reason that they, they did this, and, the, and uh, for most of these projects that went out into these remote areas, they had a connection with people on the ground there. Either they had family there, they had been there, and that connection gave them the on-the-ground know-how on how to get stuff done in what is always a tricky situation. The third thing that happened was that they were incredibly efficient and transparent. Now, normally when you hear stories about charities doing disaster relief, it's something like the Red Cross in Haiti. Now, in 2015, uh, NPR and ProPublica put out this report entitled how the Red Cross raised half a billion dollars for Haiti and built six homes. Now, while the title is obviously dramatic and intended to be so, the reporting was thorough. And uh, while the Red Cross responded to the, all the claims in there, what they couldn't do was actually explain where the money went. Now, compare that with people like Darren from the Brighton Shelter Build, and whenever he went over to build a house or a community centre over in the camps in Calais, he would take photos and on the train back from Calais, he would stitch them together into a little video and before he got home, people knew exactly what he'd been doing. And I think the reason that people are so efficient and transparent with their money here is that who they get the money for, from is quite different. Normally they're raising funds from family and friends. And so wasting their money means ripping off your mum. And you know, I know that if I'm faced with a choice between facing the charity commission or facing the mum commission, I know which one I take. So when you look at all these projects as a whole and as a collective, they're doing something quite magical. They're doing something that governments and big charities would struggle to do. They had, in effect, as a collective, without ever intending to, created a better form of disaster relief. And this method of using loosely connected projects all working towards a common goal doesn't just work in disaster relief. It turns out it works in all sorts of social cause areas. Now, the, the way that we think about this is that the current model of charity and, and doing good is a set of monopoly charity providers that are entrusted by us to do social impact, whereas what these people are creating is a world where all these people can put up their hand and you create a market. And this market is much better at delivering more impact for more people than the monopoly is. Since launching Chuffed in 2013, 130,000 people have donated over 12 million pounds 
to campaigns on chuffed. But more important than that, 7,000 of these projects from 300 in our first year have come to life. And if we can get that from 7,000 to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, our view on what our society looks like will change. We won't be a group of mean-spirited people shouting slogans and building walls. We'll be a world full of people who put up their hand to do stuff. And that's a world I think we can all be proud of. Thank you.